Later, I talked with a Democratic candidate for Secretary of State, small business owner, and Forest Park City Council member, Chelsea Clark. Part of this goes back to my father. Um, 1964, Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama, my dad's 17, and he was, you know, in nonviolent protest marching, and the civil rights movement was jailed. Um, you know, you have Dr. Martin Luther King writing a letter from the Birmingham jail. You have my dad, my father sitting in there with other folks from the movement. And so what I absolutely refuse to do is to continue to fight my father's battles. Um, so very intimately and passionately, um, connected with this type of work and with the defending of democracy and voting rights. And then I'm a small businesswoman, um, so I understand some of the challenges that small business owners are facing, as that's also um, part of the responsibility of this office. And then most importantly, making sure that we can restore the faith that people had in our election system. Um, this is about having a moral courage to do what's right on behalf of voters and to be honest and transparent. And that is not something that I'm seeing currently in the administration. And so I felt it was my civic duty, quite frankly, to get involved. You mentioned on your website as a point of your platform that you will stop voter purges. What do you mean by that? The way Ohio removes voters mm -hmm. from its voter rolls was upheld by the U.S. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court in 2018. Yes, it was. I do mean unnecessary voter purges. And so, of course, uh, the process of purging gets rid of folks that have been that have moved outside their jurisdiction, um, folks that have passed on. And so those are completely, um, you know, those are valid. Um, but what we saw um, from the current administration in 2019, we saw almost 400,000 um, folks get that get um, prepared to be purged. And when an independent uh, in, uh, organization had come in to, to review and analyze what was happening, we found that tens of thousands of those individuals were in fact eligible voters, were folks that had just previously voted. And so making sure that we've got a system that's very responsive and accurate, uh, instead of targeting certain um, communities, groups, and age groups and things like that is what I mean by that. Unnecessary voter purges is not something that's, that's necessary. As Secretary of State, you would also be on the Ohio Redistricting Commission. Yes. And I know Democrats have talked about drawing fair maps if they're elected, but you and at least one of the other Democrats on mm -hmm. the commission would, or one of the other Democrats running, mm -hmm. would have to be elected to, for Democrats to have a bigger role on the commission. So how would Democrats, and how would you be able to draw fair maps if you are not in the majority on the commission? Well, the Secretary of State's role is first and foremost not to be partisan. This is not about, you know, this is not about Republican versus Demo Democrat. This is about fact versus fiction. This is about democracy versus autocracy. And in 2018, voters overwhelmingly across this state, almost 75% of us said, hey, we want a, a, um, a reform in the redistricting process. And that is not what we saw being upheld. Instead, what we saw was partisan politics at play and obstruction. Those maps, even, um, even my opponent and um, the governor said, hey, we, we're, we're concerned about the constitutionality of these and, and quotes, they're even asinine, but yet they continue to vote for them. That is the problem with what's happening at the state house is that po political um, partisanship is taking place of good governance. It's taking place of doing the will of Ohio voters. And it's going to take someone that's not going to cave to extremists in order to do that. And first and foremost, re, um, first and foremost, push the agenda of what Ohio voters want, whether you like it or not. This is not about a blue seat. This is not about a red seat. That seat is red, white, and blue, and that's what I tell people. You were endorsed by the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, the group associated with former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. The legal arm of that group was mm -hmm. one of the groups that sued Ohio over unconstitutional mm -hmm. maps or maps that were ruled unconstitutional. Since so if you're elected, you will be on that commission. Should you accept an endorsement from this group? Well, like I said, um, we are talking about fair maps to be at play. There were several independent map, maker, map makers that brought forth maps that were more commiserate with the actual voting, pa the voting patterns for Ohio. And each time the GOP on our redistricting commission refused to accept them. Not only has this cost us a lot of time, this has put us in a bifurcated primary. The most, uh, I mean, we spent over $25 million on a second primary, unprecedented, that hardly anybody even vote. Um, um, even participated in. And so, again, what we're seeing is partisan politics. This is not the place for it. What 
is the place is making sure that we create policy and that we vote on maps that are constitutional. And my opponent even tried to come after the, you know, the Republican Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court that didn't rule against them. This is about constitutionality. And I, you know, I, I uh, study political science at Miami University. I'm absolutely going to uphold the Constitution of Ohio. And that is Part of that is not playing sides. Part of that is doing exactly what the will of the people have voted for. That is what democracy is about. Do you think taking that endorsement, though, is a partisan stance? I do not. Let me ask you about uh, Ohio's elections. It's been said several times that Ohio runs its elections fairly well. Republicans nationwide, and sometimes in Ohio, have baselessly talked about widespread voter fraud. And when the most recent referral to county prosecutors was four people from the 2020 election when we had 5.9 million people who voted. Uh, but Democrats have also sounded the alarm about things that could be viewed as reasonable limitations, such as shortening the early voting period to give more time for boards of elections to prepare, also shortening the window to request early ballots mm -hmm. to give people time to get those and return them. Are claims that changes in voting laws can lead to voter suppression, are those unnecessary criticisms of the voting system and could they lead to voter suppression and problems? Well, here in Ohio, we do have some voter suppression tactics at, at, at play. Um, we have gone from, you know, a leader in voting rights to now an absolute debacle. I mean, this is, for the past two cycles, this has been a nightmare in what's happening. Again, this is costing us millions of dollars because people have been derelict at the helm and make and playing uh, you know, playing to the extremes. And, and so, yes, when we look at, um, you know, voter suppression tactics here in Ohio, those limitations are exactly, th those can be considered um, suppression tactics. If you are limiting, um, you know, the amount of accessible secured ballot boxes in a county that make it difficult for working class folks or folks in our rural counties to actually uh, get to a, a ballot safely, uh, if you are condensing uh, early voting times, if you're closing polling locations, uh, there's a number of different things that are at play that are making it more difficult for people to vote. And they've based these limitations on the fact that there's somehow this widespread voter pr fraud when the numbers say otherwise. It just is not the case. You're talking about less than point 0.1% of like it's known, point zero, 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 right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, known intentional voter fraud. And so that's an infinitesimal in the world of business. It wouldn't even be chartable. And so, you know, what's happening is, is we're trying to create a solution for a problem that really just doesn't exist. Your opponent, Frank LaRose, the Secretary of State, says he affirms the results of the 2020 election and that Joe Biden won. But he also says that things there were things that went wrong in 2020 that need to be found and improved upon by 2024. Do you agree? And is there a model that you would want to follow or a state that you think is doing it better than Ohio is doing it? I think first and foremost, we have got to fix redistricting. I mean, until, until we get, uh, until we get folks that are going to endeavor to uphold the constitution and act in a democratic fashion, we are not going to fix the situation that, that we have. And so that that is the first um, line of defense, and that's a, a serious issue that we have. Uh, I do believe that he's, you know, he's really gone back and forth at times, right? It's kind of, you know, on one moment, there's there's this this voter uh, fraud that we've got to take care of and, and, and put, you know, policies in place to, 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 um, to make it uh, more difficult for people to cheat. Um, but at the same time, that's, you know, when the numbers don't indicate that that's actually in existence, then you've got to go and pull your other political card. The problem with that is that the conversation keeps coming back to really partisan politics. Again, you know, shifting the line and, you know, enforcing, um, enforcing laws when it's convenient for your political friends versus just doing the right thing across the board and making sure it's fair. And what people don't want and what people are tired of is that type of, of those type of games and, and backdoor politics happening um, with their very intimate decisions and their civic duty and, and engagement process and wanting to vote. That's what we've got to get out of it. You and the other Democrats running for the statewide executive offices are being dramatically out fundraised by Republicans. How do you get your message out? So we get our message out and uh, we get our message out in a number of different ways. A lot of that is being, you know, just good old fashioned people power. <laughs> you know, I say uh, what we say on the farm is, you know, you got to put it where the goats can get it. And so what we do, you know, when we're out in um, out on the campaign trails and things like that, we are talking and most mostly listening to what 
concerns people. And the people um, of this state are absolutely tired. They're worn out of hearing the bickering and the back and forth and this and that uh, when it comes to things that are really really common, that can be common sense approached and fixed. And what we've got to do is get back to the actual work and in, in being in office. And so, you know, coming in um, with honesty and wanting transparency and things like that and having a good value system is going to be imperative. And we are seeing that message being lifted and carried throughout the state in a number of different ways and, and that is coming back to us. And finally, the Ohio Supreme Court has ordered the Secretary of State's office to restore mm -hmm. podcaster Terpsahor Maris onto the ballot as an independent candidate in your race. Sure. Maris had appealed the decision from the Assistant Secretary of State to strike mm -hmm. nine signatures from her petitions, which were challenged mm -hmm. by Ohio Republican Party Executive Director Justin Biss, Republican former Ohio Supreme Court mm -hmm. Justice Terrence O'Donnell mm -hmm. had recommended striking 18 signatures. Maris is a Trump supporter. She is a 2020 election denier. While she could potentially draw mm -hmm. votes away from your opponent because she tried to run mm -hmm. in May as a Republican mm -hmm. but was not on the ballot, mm -hmm. how do you feel about this? I'm just looking for a very quick statement here. <laughs> sure. So again, um, the current Secretary of State, what he's done is use his power um, and he's pummeled people. What we see is him picking and choosing political friends and allies that he wants to run in these contestable races versus just laying it out and making it fair across the board. I don't care who's running. I don't care if you're an independent Republican or otherwise, or Democrat or otherwise. If you've met the uh, requirements, you should be allowed to run. It is what's fair. And what happened was is when he did dismiss it, the, so the court came back and said, hey, no, she actually can run. And that was the right thing to do.